I've had a lot of you write into me about a recent podcast that I replayed on the uh, topic of yoga. And uh, one person said, so we get it. Yoga is bad, bad, bad. But can we do any of the poses? Some of them are good for the body. Does this border on legalism or is it legalism? These are great questions. Let's jump right in. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. Stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Heidi St. John podcast. I'm glad you guys have joined me today. I am really interested in hearing from my audience. I love hearing from you. It's the reason we do Mailbox Monday. It's why I've made my podcast uh, accessible to you. So that if you have a question you want aired here, we do that. And the, there is no there is no topic, and I'm not even joking, nothing has made you guys more uh, uh, willing to engage than the topic of so-called Christian yoga. Several years ago, and it's been a long time now, I had a guest on the show. Her name is Jessica. She changed my mind about the practice of yoga. And before she talked to me, I was the person who was like, listen, I know it has roots in Buddhism, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter because I don't believe that stuff. I don't believe that I'm connecting with the earth. I don't believe in any of the tenets of the Buddhist religion. And so I'm just going to go ahead and do the, the, uh, the, the practice of yoga and do the stretches and stuff because it helps my back. Well, it's a serious issue for me because I've got several fractures in my lower back from several things that happened when I was younger. And so I live with chronic pain and those stretches and those exercises were really genuinely helping me. And so I could not understand why a Christian would be such a brat about it and tell me that what I was doing was wrong until I met Jessica and she explained to me what was going on behind the scenes in the spiritual realm with regard to yoga. It's the same thing, you guys, with participating in Halloween. The Bible says have nothing to do with evil deeds and uh, the, the, the practice of darkness. And so that's why uh, yesterday I was talking a little bit about Halloween and how I have really changed my opinion on that as well. I grew up thinking it's no big deal. It doesn't matter. Uh, people in my family really liked to, to celebrate it. We were just having what we thought was just fun, you know, honest fun. And then I said, uh, I was really challenged to think about what does the Bible say? Philippians 4, 8, whatever's good, whatever's right, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, let your mind dwell on these things. And as Christians, we have an awful lot right now vying for our attention. A lot of secularism has seeped its way into the church and a lot of Christians are really struggling with what does it look like to walk with the Lord in uh, in a culture that has largely divorced our behavior, i.e. yoga, i.e. going to haunted houses or participating and watching things on television that we know go against what the Bible says, and yet God's word is so clear. Uh, we are to have nothing to do with things that we know are evil. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. The Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Philippians 4, 8, whatever's good, whatever's right. We know that God wants us to focus on those things because no one understands the human heart better than creator God. And he knows how susceptible we are to um, allowing our lives to be compromised. And I think by and large, that's a huge part of the problem in the culture right now, right? We have allowed ourselves and our, uh, our lives as Christians to be taken captive by the world that we live in. And so I thought I would read this to you today, uh, a, a, a comment I got from a, a listener named Chris who, hey, Chris, thanks for writing into me. I think his wife listens to the show. So it sounds like you might be listening to Chris. So thanks for writing into me. This is what he said. And I thought this was worth commenting on and taking this. And we'll talk about legalism as well. He said, uh, Heidi, so yoga is bad. Got it. The biomechanics of some positions are really good for physical air therapy and exercise. If you are saying that no yoga position should be done at all, even without knowledge that it's a yoga position, then what's another option? Saying bad, bad, bad without other options is taking away my physical therapy exercise with nothing to replace it. I learned some stretches and exercises in the gym and the army. It was, uh, I was a high school student. It was a high school student that pointed to me out to me that it was yoga. For example, the pigeon stretch, bridge pose, a toonie uh, spinal twist, et cetera, the low lunge. Uh, and uh, he wanted me to comment on that. So first of all, 
I think we want to be very careful not to slip into legalism. I think several people, myself included, uh, we were taught uh, uh, several stretches. I did this when I broke my back the first time. But I later learned the thing I was doing is something in yoga that is called downward dog. So what I'm talking about is marrying the two things together. I'm not saying you can't do that particular stretch. If it's stretching your back, stretching your hamstrings, whatever it is. I'm saying that when we participate in something called holy yoga, there's nothing holy about it. So I'm not saying you can never do the stretches. I'm saying we shouldn't be having, we shouldn't be hosting so-called yoga classes in our churches or participating in something called holy yoga because you can't unhitch the practice of yoga. Stop calling it yoga. You want to do a stretch? Great. But when you say I'm practicing yoga, you got to understand what you're doing. So I want to read to you from an article that I actually posted on my personal Facebook page by a guy named Jonathan Zin Trong. It looks to me like he may be a Vietnamese uh, in his ethnicity and grew up in Buddhism. Listen to what he said. Let's talk about a controversial topic for Christians, yoga in the church. Growing up as a radical Buddhist, I taught many occult practices, experiences which now allow me as a Christian to quickly discern the occult from what is truly holy and righteous. As a child, many Buddhist monks believed me to be a reincarnation of Buddha from Tibet. They asked me to train people on many occult practices, such as opening third eyes, meditation, astral projection, keys to commanding demons, mind control, mind programming, and the cursing or charging of objects to impart demons into the possessor, among other wicked and occult things. Christian yoga, otherwise called holy yoga, is crazy, dangerous, and idiotic for any Christian to practice. Amending anything, especially things meant to be the worship of other gods, is like saying Christian Christian witchcraft, holy voodoo, Christian magic or holy Halloween. The truth about yoga is that all forms, no matter how it's repackaged, are forms of idol worship, the worship of false gods and demons. If you ask the true yogis, a master of the religion of yoga, they frequently scoff at the idea that Christians belittle their religious acts of worship by calling the religion of yoga, quote, stretching or exercise. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit root word yug, which literally means to yoke or to unite. This union does not refer to the union of your fingers touching your toes or your nose touching your knees. Instead, each yoga pose is designed to create a yug, a yoke, or a union of the person who practices yoga. Now there, Chris, this is, this is what I want you to hear. It's the person who's practicing yoga with the three. So they're, they're, these poses are designed to hitch the person who's practicing yoga with the three distinct Hindu gods, Brahma, Shiva, and Yeshuna, the Hindu version of the Holy Trinity. This practice of yoga, no matter how you attempt to repackage, justify, or sanctify it, is 100% idol worship. These poses invite this so-called trinity of Buddhism to enter you, to be yoked to you, and to be unified with your soul, mind, will, and emotions, and your flesh, your body. What I find sad and interesting is that most, quote, Christians who practice yoga religiously will defend their practice with more fervency and more passion than their relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, You can find this article at godmanifest.com forward slash holy yoga. And I could not agree more. It's amazing. You know, we get all offended. Wait a minute. I'm, you know, we're doing holy yoga in our church. Well, how about this? Knock it off. Knock it off. You guys, we are to have nothing to do with idol worship. And that's exactly what this is. And the people that understand what yoga is know that. Ezekiel 44 verse 23 says, Moreover, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. First Peter 3.15, Sanctify yourself, uh, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. I think this is interesting. I want to go back to First Peter chapter 3 for just a moment. And listen to what he, he he's talking about earlier in the passage, what it means to suffer for the sake of righteousness. Now, in Christianity today, we don't like to suffer for the sake of righteousness. We certainly don't want to, uh, you know, to inconvenience ourselves by taking our kids out of a wicked and profane system that's teaching our children that they evolve from an animal and that uh, and that their parents aren't an authority in their lives and there's 400 genders and blah, 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 blah. We want to be comfortable. 
Well, guess what? In the United States, we are going to learn what it means very quickly now to be uncomfortable. And the uh, apostle Peter is talking about this in 1 Peter 3, and he's telling them how to suffer for the sake of righteousness and why it's important. And he says, finally, starting in verse eight, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not replay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. If you go down to verse 13, he says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them. Don't be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you and do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And I thought it was interesting that the article that was uh, posted on Facebook, and I'll link back to it in the show notes today, that the author of this article said that he finds it fascinating that Christians would defend the practice of yoga more passionately than they would defend their faith in Jesus Christ. Because it is sort of, um, uh, it's hip, right, to do yoga. Everybody's sort of into it. You can do hot yoga. We do holy yoga. And as I told you guys before, I fell into that camp until another Christian sister in the Lord came to me and said, this isn't right. And once I understood, oh my goodness, I shouldn't be doing this. I stopped doing it. Does that mean that I never stretch? That I never, uh, that I never, that I never uh, do a, a pose that's called downward dog? No, I do that. I might do that when I get up in the morning, when I get out of bed for a moment. I might, uh, I might do some stretches that help my back. What I'm saying is when we, when we go to classes at the gym and it's a yoga class, no, don't do that. If you're hosting, quote, holy yoga at your church, stop. There's nothing holy about it. You guys can be doing Pilates. There's lots of different things that we can do that will um, incorporate stretching and strengthening in our lives. And I do think it's true. You know, one uh, criticism that someone wrote into me about was that Christians seem to not care very much about our temple. Well, I think that I think that you can make a case for that. But there are lots of Christians like my friend, Dr. Mark Sherwood, who come on my show all the time to teach you how to take better care of the temple, which God has given you. And so, of course, it's very important for us to take care of our bodies. Our bodies belong to the Lord and we need to honor the Lord as we take care of the temple that he's given us. But you guys, yoga is not an OK thing to practice. We don't want to fall into legalism, which means, you know, you see uh, a Christian brother or sister in the Lord and they're, you know, they're doing a pose that you're like, oh, hey, I saw that in a yoga book one time. Uh, if, if we're doing the poses independently and we're not doing them as a part of practice of yoga, in other words, I wouldn't do, um, I can't even, it's been such a long time, you guys, since I practiced, I can't even remember the names, but there's like the sunrise pose. And I would never do a flow, like a yoga flow. I would never do that anymore. Um, I might do some of the stretches, but I would never do them in order. I would never do them as I learned them in yoga. You know, over 10 years ago from my physical therapist, I stopped doing that a long time ago. And so I would unhitch yoga from Christianity. There is no such thing as, quote, holy yoga. I know that offends some of you. I would ask you to take it before the Lord and ask God what he would have you do with the information that you have been given. There are so many questions that you've been writing into me with. I wanted to get to a couple more of them in today's show. Uh, an anonymous listener in Virginia said, do you think someone can be a narcissist and a Christian at the same time? Is it biblical to remain in a marriage with a narcissist who believes that they should be put first above all else? This is a really important conversation to have because I think that as people, that are trying to follow Jesus, we are still struggling with our flesh, right? We still want what we want. We can we want to make excuses, uh, and especially in the area of marriage, I'm seeing this more and more. It's important that we remember that God sees marriage as a covenant relationship, and one does not simply end their marriage because they're unhappy, because they're married to a narcissist, because they're married to somebody who you know continues to leave uh, their dirty clothes out on the floor rather than put them in the hamper. I mean, I've talked to women and men 
actually all over the country for for decades now out on the road. And I've heard every kind of excuse under the sun for ending a marriage. As you guys heard me say several weeks ago, I do not believe that it is right nor healthy nor biblical to stay in a marriage where a, a husband or let's say a wife is abusing you or you're being beaten or sexually abused. Uh, obviously, this is not God's heart. But I think we need to be very, very careful that we don't then take that over into every little thing that bothers us. For example, does the Bible have a biblical out for women who are married to a narcissist or a man who is married to a narcissist? The simple answer is no. Marriage is a covenant relationship and it should be, uh, it's a very last resort. Divorce is, is the last resort. The Bible says that God hates divorce. That is not something that he wants. He made provision for it because he realizes that, uh, that it had to be done. It, we had to make provision because we're living in a sinful, fallen world. But to say that because someone is a narcissist and they think they should be first above everything else, that's reason for a person to get out of a marriage. I don't think that's true. I think it's reason for you to continue to pray. I think it's reason for you to get counseling. I think it's reason for you to, uh, to find help that you need. And I would never stop doing that. I would never stop looking for help. I have watched, uh, seen, you know, literally with my own two eyes, many times where God has done what we thought was the impossible in healing marriages of friends of ours or people that we met out on the road when I was speaking or whatever. We, sh we, we seem to want to limit God to, you know, certain areas where we want his help. But if we want an excuse to get out of our marriage, we just sort of get out of it. And we, we can fall into legalism, which is what I, you know, how I grew up. And my, my mother, you know, obviously in a terrible relationship with my dad. And I listened, you know, behind closed doors as a young girl to the elders and the pastors of our church tell my mom that she had no right to get out of this, you know, this terribly abusive relationship that she was in and just, you know, making, telling her, listen, you need to have sex more with your husband. You need to be more submissive. They didn't understand that had nothing to do with what was happening in our home at the time. And you can fall into legalism where we just, we, we can't even act with common sense or look at God's heart for husbands in the home. Husbands love your wives like Christ of the church. Women are called to honor and respect their husbands. And we can be caught in the legalistic side of of uh, of any issue, whether it's you know exercise or whatever you want to want to call it, or we can swing way over here to liberty, where we just go, you know, I'm unhappy, and I don't think God wants me to be unhappy. I had a woman come to me one time and say, I'm very unhappy in my marriage. I don't think God God wants me to be unhappy. Well, guess what? Your marriage isn't about your happiness. Marriage is an opportunity for you to become more like Christ. It's sanctifying, right? Anyone who's been married for more than 15 seconds understands that there will be good days and bad days. And sometimes you guys, good years and bad years, bad seasons, difficult seasons where we struggle financially or we struggle with our health or whatever it is. And God says, work these things out together. We're to love one another. And so I think I've said this before, but at, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, the devil doesn't care what ditch he knocks you into so long as you're in a ditch. So you could be in the ditch of legalism where you, uh, you unilaterally apply what looks to be a, a biblical principle without common sense, without asking the Lord for, for his help with the application of that biblical principle. And you could stay in a really abusive relationship or you can make excuses for homosexual sex. We see this also, right, when you swing over into liberty. And the, the truth of the scriptures of God is found through reading his word and rightly dividing it. This is why God says, study my word, right? Study it in context. The truth is always found in the middle. And I think our human nature, it typically pulls us to one way, one, one uh, side of this narrow road that the Bible says leads to life, either to one side, the ditch of legalism, or the other side, the ditch of liberty, where everything goes and grace covers everything and it doesn't matter anyways because we're saved and we're going to heaven so we'll just do whatever we want. Those are both a misapplication of scripture and a misunderstanding of the heart of God. And so we wanna be studying his word. It's part of the reason why uh, we have Mom Strong International and, faith, and the Faith That Speaks community as we're studying the word and we're trying to understand it so that we can rightly divide it so that we can become more like Jesus. 
And I want to encourage you to that end today, whether the situation that you're dealing with uh, is, you know, something as I feel like black and white as whether or not we should be practicing yoga or whether or not we should remain in our marriages. God's word has the answer and we need to be seeking him. The Bible also says that wisdom is found in the counsel of many, which means that we want to seek out the, the thoughts of those that we know that are following hard after Jesus Christ. So when I say, you know, wisdom is found in the counsel of many, right? Quoting to you from the scriptures, that means that you're looking for wisdom from someone whose life is a life that is worthy of following. You see someone leading an exemplary life and you know these guys are following Jesus and you've got a question about something, we should be living in community and asking those questions. Uh, And so some of these are difficult issues. Some of them, I think, are more simple, very uh, like, you know, you're going to ask me about the issue of homosexuality. That is clearly sin. Uh, There's no if, ands, or buts about it in the word of God. We have made these things more difficult to understand because we've cherry-picked verses out of the Bible and then put them together out of order, out of context, and then come up with a theology that actually doesn't match up to the scriptures. And so we want to be careful of that. I really appreciate you writing in. I love having these conversations. I love reading your comments, uh, even your criticisms. I don't mind those. You guys can reach out to me, HeidiStJohn.com forward slash Mailbox Monday. Last night, I started our Bible study in person. We had a great turnout. We're really excited about that. We are filming this series on the book of Revelation, and we will be releasing that as soon as it's past post-production so that those of you who want to watch these videos in your churches and for your women's Bible studies, et cetera, et cetera, can do that. Uh, God gave us the book of Revelation. Revelation literally means an unveiling. And notice uh, it's the unveiling, right? It's the final word. God will have the final word as to how things are going to wind down in the age that we live in. And I believe the church age is coming to an end. I'm going to make a case for that as we go along and continue to teach through the book of Revelation. But if you'd like to join me, I, I do a question and answer on Tuesdays with my listeners, and we do a little bit more of an informal Zoom uh, regarding the study on the book of Revelation. I'd love to have you join me. You can sign up at momstronginternational.com. Listen, we appreciate you guys. I love to hear your ideas, your show ideas, and you can write into me with questions. We're going to actually play some of those on tomorrow's podcast So uh, if you left me a voicemail at Spotify, we're going to be addressing a whole bunch of those in the next couple of days at the show. If you're a subscriber to the Heidi St. John podcast, you know how to reach out to me and I'm looking forward to hearing from you as well. I hope you guys have a great day. And if you haven't left reviews for my brand new book, Mom Strong 365, please do me a huge favor. Hop on over to Amazon and leave a review for that book as well. We love you guys. Have a great day. Love your people well. And I'll see you right back here tomorrow at the intersection of faith 